Okay, so this is the second video lecture on the top in the chapter of theory uh, for human growth and development. So in this lecture, I want to talk about the psychoanalytical uh, perspectives of human growth and development. Um, specifically, we're going I'm going to introduce or discuss a little bit about Freud's Freud's ideas and talk about a fellow by the name of Erickson. So hopefully you remember a little bit about Freud from your intro, from your general psychology class or you've heard about him before. So uh, what Freud, now he's considered sort of the founding psychoanalytical uh, theorist. And I want to emphasize again that all of the psychoanalytical theories have take for granted the role of the subconscious, the role of the things that are below your awareness. Freud specifically argued that below our conscious awareness were these three elements of our personality that he called the id, the ego, and the superego. And these three elements were constantly in competition about controlling, uh, influencing how we acted, how we felt. The id would be kind of, was kind of like the uh, kind of like the devil on your shoulder. The ego was, no, no, the other way around. I always get these confused. You had the id was the devil. You had the super ego, which was like the hero, the super, the, all of the culture, the consciousness. And then in between these two, you had the ego. And the ego was charged with balancing the angel and the devil or the id and the super ego. And every, all, all of our uh, struggles, all of our psychological struggles, all of our behaviors were really rooted in this constant negotiation and competition for control between the id and the ego. All right. He also argued that as we went through life, right, as it relates to development, but as we went through, uh, as we went, as we moved from infancy to death, we went through what he called the psychosexual stages of development. Now, one of the things that Freud's criticized with for is his emphasis on sexual functioning, right? But he argued that below our conscious awareness, right, was our, okay, so as we came of age, as we went from infancy to adulthood, we shifted our, the, the source of our pleasure our sensory, our sexual sensory region shifted. So in an infant, an infant would take all of its pleasure and all of its, inf all of its uh, information through its mouth. So this is what we would call an oral stage, right? Then you get to somewhere around three years old when you're potty training. And because of the infant emphasis on bowel movements and urination, this was what he called an anal stage. Then we moved on later on in life where we have the focus on our genital stage. This would be like teenager. No, no, no. This is, um, I guess it's early childhood, right? Early childhood, you shifted to the phallic stage. So this would be if you've ever spent much time with, you know, maybe three, four, five-year-old little boys, how they always seem to have their hands down their pants. Later on, then we go through a period where um, he, I guess he didn't have, for lack of a better word, he didn't have a um, a term for it, he called this is this was the latency stage. So this is middle childhood. This is um, late elementary school, and then when you get to adulthood and beyond, this is what he would call as your genital stage. Now, another criticism of Freud is that basically development ended once you became a fully sexualized adult. But how we acted as an adult and the the struggles that we had and our personality was expressed depended on how we had transitioned through these different stages. If we had gotten what the, the three here is this word right here of gratification, frustration, or fixation. If we had gotten too much gratification in the oral stage, right? If we had taken too much pleasure from putting things into our mouth, we might become fixated, right? We, and that would mean that we didn't, successfully transition into the next stage. Somebody who became fixated in the oral stage, and again, this is all below your, your conscious awareness, might become a nail biter or an overeater or a smoker, but they would become sort of obsessed. They, wouldn't, they didn't have a healthy transition out of the oral stage. 
If, however, we successfully transitioned out of that stage, we might, if we got too much pleasure or not enough pleasure in our anal stage, we might get stuck there. And we could potentially be, anal. if you've ever heard the phrase that somebody is anal, anal, that usually is short for anal retentive, which describes a person who's kind of uptight, kind of clenched up. Or somebody might become expulsive, anal expulsive. And this is a person who is, you know, as you might imagine, they're slobs, but they're all kind of out there, right? And conversely so. So we could get, we could get stuck at each of these stages. Something that happened from, um, according to this theory, during the phallic stage, right? Yeah, there it is right there, aged four, is, and, and another criticism of Freud is that he focused almost exclusively on boys, right, on men, men, eventually he comes back and he talks about girls, right, but this was the time where a young boy might become aware, might, yes, become aware that his father has a penis and his mother doesn't have a penis, um, and he might develop penis envy, right, or we, yes, no, I'm getting this all back and getting this off the piece, but a woman, right, a girl, might develop this envy that a man has a penis and there might then be a conflict between the daughter and the mother over access to the father's penis and this is another point sort of of criticism we'll talk a little bit more about uh, some of freud's um some of freud's focus on uh, on on these different psychosexual stages but i want to move on the point again is that there's a lot of emphasis on sex and there's actually a lot of emphasis on, on aggression, but what makes all of the analytical people uh, theories the same is the focus on the subconscious. Erickson's model, again, focuses on the subconscious and argues that in just the same way that Freud had these different stages of development, Erickson does too. And he calls these different stages crises. And we have to successfully transition out of the first, or we have to successfully um, go through the first crises before we get to the next crises. And if we are, if we don't successfully transition, this will have implications for the rest of our life. So let me begin with this first one. His first stage, uh, his first developmental stage, and the first developmental crisis was trust versus mistrust. And this was associated with infants up to a year old. So a child who was raised, a, a child who experienced caregivers who responded to their needs. So a baby who cries, right? And an adult person or a, 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 a oh, I always say, so often say a giant person, right? Came and comforted them, changed their diaper, fed them, made them warm. If this happens over and over and over again, child cries, adult takes, adult makes them better. They learn, this again happens over and over again, they learn that if I have a need, I can trust that somebody else will take care of me. As opposed to a child who cries and nobody comes, they cry, nobody comes, they cry, maybe somebody even comes and hurts them, makes it worse, they don't learn trust. So for an infant whose needs are met habitually over and over and over again, they learn the crisis here. They learn that they can trust other people, that their needs will be met, right? They have the crisis is between basic trust and basic mistrust. They learn that people are good. The next stage, right? So that would be a successful transition. And actually you fast forward, even with this element of trust versus mistrust, and, <clears throat> and you get to um, attachment, right? And we see, that, uh, we see that how a child learns to trust their parents in infancy actually, according to this theory, predicts what kind of marital partner they're gonna be if they're going to trust their partner, if they're going to respond to their partner's needs, and if their parent is, if their partner is going to, they, they trust their partner to respond to their needs, all going back to, did their mother or father or caregiver come when they cried? A child who cries and has nobody come to get them may develop what we would call an attachment disorder. An attachment disorder is they don't learn to trust. And some of the theories in attachment disorder says that children who don't learn to trust in infancy may never learn to trust. They may never have the 
mm, the psychological mechanisms to trust another person. So in essence, as we move through, and I, I feel like I'm already at my, well, I am already at my 10 minutes, right? The first stage is trust versus mistrust. The next one is autonomy versus shame. And this happens in your toddler years where a child learns that they are capable, autonomy, meaning I can do it, right? Where they are capable of doing something their self. So you see in two-year-olds, me do, me do, right? And, and small children are constantly wanting to do things for themselves. And this drives their parents crazy. To successfully help a child transition through this next stage, you must give choices. And that's what I've tried to outline here in the chapter in this handout, right? So success, what, meet, what a child needs, according to this theory, for successful transition out of the second stage, the second crisis, autonomy versus shame and doubt, is they need choices and they need to be able to successfully um do whatever it is they're trying to do, like successfully put on their socks or whatever. You get to f six years old and you've got initiation and you've got guilt, right? A child who you'll see this a lot too. I want to help. I want to help. I want to help. Does the caregiver give them the opportunity to help and be successful in helping? Or are they always told over and over again, no, you're too small. No, you can't do this. In that case, they learn to feel bad about themselves because they can't do it as opposed to, I can initiate something. I can actually do something. Industry, the next one is industry versus inferiority. Oh my gosh, this is middle school. This is puberty. I can still remember this time myself where I said to my mother, I just want to be good at something without trying, right? So a, a person who is identifies something during this stage of life where they can be good at it will successfully transition as opposed to somebody who gets through to young adulthood and still has not found anything that they're good at or they feel like they're good at, they will feel inferior according to this theory. Then you get to your young adulthood, you've got identity versus role confusion, right? I mean, they, I see this in my 22 year old. She's trying all these different things. She's changing her major over and over again. She's working in a factory in Kansas City. She's working in a bar in Manhattan, right? She's really trying, she's really struggling with who her identity is. The successful transition out of this stage will be when she figures out who she is, but we have to experience, we have to try a lot of different things. You get to stage six, right? Crisis six, this is intimacy versus isolation. Middle adulthood, are you going to turn towards others? Are you going to be a family-centered kind of person? Or are you going to turn away from each other, right? Are you going to connect or turn away? A lot we see marriages and divorces. We see divorces and remarriages all happening during this period. Then you've got gentrid, oh, I never say that word right, genate, the uh huh, versus stagnation. This is middle adult. This is where I am. And this is where we start to feel like we kind of want to set things up for the future, right? We, we set our, if you have resources, we, we establish our trusts for the future. We start thinking about what I can leave to my children. We start to set up our grandchildren's college fund. And it's all about the successful transition is all about what will I leave behind when I'm gone? We start thinking about one of the weird questions I find myself thinking about is what do I want people to say about when, when I'm dead and I'm only 51 years old? And then you get to number eight, which is ego identity. This is the last stage, according to Erickson. And this stage is about ego identity versus despair. Um, many students, I think, have seen in your discussion posts that you work in, uh, you work in nursing homes or with older people, this is probably the stage that your older people are experiencing. And these are the ones that are like really angry and bitter are probably um, experiencing more despair. The folks that are probably doing okay during late adulthood are the ones that are, you know, experiencing more of this ego identity. They're ask them about their life. They feel good about their life. Right. Part of what happens during this last stage, and we'll talk about it in the last chapter, is we start to do a life review and we look back at our life and we think, you know, I, did I have a good life or did I do do or not do things that I wished I would have done? OK, so these are the two big theories of the psychoanalytical theory and I will stop it.